Welcome to 80 More Things, where we go beyond making a murderer and discuss questionable details of the Teresa Halbach murder case. My name is Fen. You can find me on Twitter at FenMN. The song you just heard a piece of is called It Really Matters by Stacey Seabrook. If you somehow find yourself here but you haven't yet watched the Netflix series Making a Murderer, stop listening to this podcast right now and go watch both seasons before joining us here, or a lot of this won't really make any sense to you. Joining me on 80 More Things is my co-host, Julie Pompom. Hello, Julie. Hi, Finn. You can find Julie on Twitter. She tweets under the handle at Juju Pompom, so go check her out there, and she also has put together a website called workwithkz.com. And if you're looking for a resource to figure out where the case stands today and what the next step is, you can always go to workwithkz.com and find out. Okay, this is episode 10, which is the final episode in season one of 80 More Things. So for this episode, we're gonna do something a little bit different and it'll just be Julie and me talking about day 34 of the 80 days of 80 More Things. After this, we're going to take a short break, and then we'll be back for an exciting season two with many more guests, and we're really excited about season two, and I can't wait to hear what our guests have to say. I'm really excited, too. So day 34, and day 34 of 80 Days of 80 More Things, and I'm slowly getting these up on the website. I'm not sure if I have 34 up yet. I don't think I do, but let me open day 34 here. So day 34 is Stephen's blood found only in the front of the RAV and Teresa's blood found only in the back of the RAV. No instances of their blood being co-mingled. And that links to a Reddit post by TX18Q. And that person on Reddit has put together a post called Six Points the Stephen Avery Guilters Sweep Under the Rug. And the first one is number one, no mix between Avery and Teresa's blood in the car. So if if this starts out, if Stephen Avery was the perpetrator, the most likely scenario is that Avery and Teresa got hurt at the same time when stabbing, raping, and cutting a throat. So like the Reddit post says, if, if he was the perpetrator, and according to law enforcement, he was actively bleeding in the RAV, while he was wearing gloves yet he supposedly left dna on the hood latch but anyway uh if he was bleeding and he was injured when he supposedly killed Teresa, there would be instances where you would find both of their blood together and that was not found anywhere at all period in the rav in the trailer, in the garage, anywhere. There's nowhere that they found a mixture of their blood, which is very strange. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. If he had killed her and was actively bleeding, there would be commingling of their blood. There would be, and there's not. It doesn't make sense that there isn't. And uh, as this person says, that is highly suspicious. Yes. So I agree with that. So number two on this person's list is cleaning up fingerprints, but not his own blood. You've also mm-hmm. mentioned fingerprints or the lack thereof in the RAV. There, there's allegedly Stephen Avery's blood in the RAV, but not one fingerprint of his was found anywhere on the RAV. Exactly. So if he didn't have gloves on, so he was leaving blood drops from a cut on his finger, then he would have been leaving fingerprints. And if he was going to clean the fingerprints up, which you can't even see, why would he clean those and not clean up the blood? It's it's just not logical. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Not that Steven's the most logical person I've ever heard of. That's <laughs> not the point. If he was going to have the forethought to wipe away his fingerprints, he would have thought, I should wipe away that blood too, which I can see, you know? Right. (laughs) Plus, it's not like they didn't find any fingerprints. Right. They found a lot of fingerprints. So he somehow selectively cleaned his own fingerprints that you can't Mm -hmm. see. 
but not right. anyone else's that you also can't see, which mm -hmm. makes no sense. Well, it's the same thing in the garage. He cleaned all of Teresa's DNA out of his garage, but left his own and other DNA and other dirt and other things. So selectively only cleaned up Teresa's DNA. Right. And the bedroom as well with his, right. you know, magical rug doctor mm -hmm. that apparently he used to clean up all of Teresa, every trace of Teresa, including scratches on the bedposts somehow. Right. That's what I was going to say. I didn't know that a rug doctor could reverse bedpost scratches. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm going to have to get me one of those for <laughs> all of my damaged furniture because wow. So that is number three, actually, on this, uh, this Reddit post. Um, it says a slash throat, a rape and cutting of hair, yet no DNA. And we have talked about that even on this podcast before, especially the hair. There should have been hair everywhere and there was none, not even one hair. Um, also, I find it, and this isn't in here, but I find it suspicious that they didn't remove the mattress for testing. If someone had been raped and brutally murdered, uh, throat slashed, stabbed in the stomach, and all of these things on a bed, why wouldn't you take the mattress for forensic examination? Exactly. If they really believed that happened, they would have taken the mattress. But I believe the things they did take from that bedroom were just for appearances. I think they invented that confession from Brendan because they could. I, I don't think they believed those events actually happened. They convicted Brendan on those things that they got him to say because those were the things they were able to get him to say. I don't think they actually believed it. Right. I think they, they had a key, they had the RAV and they went and found a bullet that had been shot through the garage wall. Mm -hmm. um, and they used those things to craft a ridiculous story Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that doesn't really even make any sense. Um, but it, I guess it makes enough sense to convict two men of murder right? for the, a lot of, the jury. A lot of people have talked about how absurd it is that Stephen and Brendan were convicted using two different narratives. And they don't understand how that's legal. But then this is something that I discussed with Travis is that if the state has enough evidence to back up whatever narrative they're presenting, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. And so, and that's what they did here. It didn't matter if it was true or not. They had enough stuff to back it up, so they used it. And the stuff they had to back up really only applied to Stephen because in Brendan's case, they had his confession and that's all they really need. Yep. Because uh, exactly. the weight that's given to a confession like that is beyond mm -hmm. anything that they could have, any kind of forensic evidence they could have brought. And there wasn't any forensic evidence. There and wasn't. Since Brendan didn't get good representation, he really just didn't stand a chance. Um, so back to this uh, Reddit post by TX18Q. <laughs> Number four is no blood in the garage. That's weird. You would think if a woman had had her throat cut, hair cut, stabbed, and is shot in the head, there would be something left from her on the garage floor. But yeah, I mean, they even jackhammered the garage floor and found no DNA in there of Whoa, Teresa. they didn't no find blood. hers. Yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's exactly what you were saying. They didn't find any of her DNA. They were trying to find her DNA because they were trying to say that Stephen and Brendan had cleaned it up, had tried to clean it up with bleach, and it would have gone down into the cracks. So they jackhammered the floor to test it. And what did they find? Nothing of Teresa. Mm -hmm. But all kinds of Stephen's DNA. And as far as cleaning up the garage floor, there is evidence now that I've seen um, or heard more 
more accurately, I've heard that the famous garage cleanup that ended with Brendan having bleach on his jeans actually occurred on October 30th. Mm -hmm. So when Brendan was saying that what they were cleaning up smelled like oil, I mean, it's pretty clear to me that they were cleaning up transmission fluid on the floor of the garage. Every, everything I've seen leads me to believe that that is the case. Mm -hmm. So it's a shame that his attorneys did him the disservice of not bringing that up. Right. There's if we can figure that out. Up. Yeah. Yeah. If we can figure it out, why couldn't they? Yeah. They obviously didn't care. Yeah. Oh, so, that makes me mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so number five, the car key that was found is actually a spare key and doesn't have the owner's DNA on it. So this was brought up, I know, in uh, Kathleen Zellner's recent filing, the fact that this was a spare key. Kathleen's most recent brief that she filed with the Court of Appeals. That one? Yep, that's the one. Which you I know can, where to get it. <laughs> which you can download a copy of at workwithkz.com. Shameless plug. I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so talking about the key, they searched seven times looking for whatever in Stephen Avery's tra tiny little trailer. Mm -hmm. And on the, what, eighth search, they found the key suddenly? Mm -hmm. Found, quote unquote. Quote unquote, found the key. Mm -hmm. And they contended that he kept the key so that he could move the car to crush it yet he didn't crush the car and nope. it was left on the salvage yard covered barely covered up with various debris that was laying around right he knows how to crush a car mm -hmm. he does it all the time but just didn't bother crushing that one i guess Again, that's weird. Um, let's see. So back to the key. Some people believe the key was created by law enforcement and planted there. Some people believe that it was a spare key that was found at Teresa's home when they went to gather the seven pairs of panties and her vibrator and all the other, you know, things that they wanted to have possession of for whatever reason. What do you think? Do you think that it was a spare key, the valet key that they found in her home? Do you think they made a key or what? How do you think this key came about? I don't have a definitive opinion either way on that. I do strongly believe it's one of those two because they, they had a key made. They said they had a key made, didn't they? They did have to have a key made, yes. Right. Because so, so why are there why, not? I don't know. Why are there? They, they had a key made so they could get into it. But, but he said in the crime lab that it was unlocked, even though they said it was locked at the salvage yard. So it, as there are in several places in this entire quote unquote investigation, there are conflicting statements. And if they had a key made and now they have this key, why are there not two keys in evidence? Well, if they had the key from the bedroom, why did they need to make a key? Because they made the key before they found the key. That's in the what I was wondering. Okay. Yes. But where is that key now? And how did they make the key? Did they, oh, they had the VIN. So they probably used the VIN to get a key they, made. I don't know how had, that's done. Yeah. They, um, I, I don't think it's, I think the VIN only works if it's the original lock, mm -hmm. but like AAA, if you call AAA, like you're locked out of your car, mm -hmm. they can make you a, a key. They can put a thing inside the, inside the slot for your key and it will, I don't know, do some sort of magic Mm -hmm. <laughs> and create a key so there are ways for them to do that to do it I don't I don't know exactly how the process works because I'm not an expert in that but I do know that you can create a key from a lock I did the same thing 
at a recent job, like I went to our locksmith and had a key made for a lock I already had that we didn't have a key for. And I had keys made for it. So I don't know how they do it, but they can do it. Now I've lost it because I, okay. Um, number six, experts conclude Teresa was not burned in Avery's backyard. So this is Dr. John DeHaan who has almost 50 years experience working with fires and bombs, said several pieces of evidence tell him that Halbach was burned elsewhere and her bones were planted behind Avery's garage. And I've seen a lot of talk about this lately. In fact, I saw a Reddit post the other day and I'll try to find it. Somebody did an analysis of the bones, the debris and whatnot that was taken out of the burn pit. Okay. So that leads me to a much more recent Reddit post um, that was just a couple of days ago by Strawberry Fields, and I'll link to this in the show notes, but the title of it is Number of Bones That Came From Inside the Halloween Fire Residue, Zero. And I think the gist of this is that all the bones were found sitting kind of on top of the fire pit. None of them were mixed in with what was determined to be the residue of the fire that he had actually had on October 31st. All of the bones were found sitting on top. So what does that tell you? That tells me they were sprinkled on top. They were not in a fire. Yep, me too. So I'll link to that um, post. It's, it's really good, a really good post. Yeah, I was just <laughs> looking for it. <laughs> So it says all of the bones claimed to be burned by Avery in his fire pit or in his pit came from either a pile of ash slash debris on top of the hard tire crust from Halloween, the tarp that was created that day from the ash slash debris, or from outside the pit and surrounding areas in the days that followed, November 10th and November 11th. And they have put in here a bunch of charts to demonstrate their findings in this. I think this is really good research. And I think this is a great example of the kind of research that you can find on Reddit under the TikTok Manitowoc subreddit. I'll, I'll put a link to TikTok Manitowoc subreddit in the show notes as well. If people wanna come join us there, there's a lot of really great research being done there. Where were we? Oh, that was the end of that. That post. was the end of that. But um, Julie, you wanted to talk about something. I did. So back in early December, there was a post on Reddit by Too Little Too Late. And I saw it come up in the Reddit posting room in Discord. And it caught my attention. And I went to go read it. And it made me realize something that I never realized before. The Reddit post is called, Where is Teresa's DNA? And the person who posted this says, it's strange that no DNA of Teresa's, as far as I know, has been found anywhere. The blood found in the RAV and the pap smear results is all there is, I think. And I, I think they got DNA off the, the the cherry Pepsi can too, right? It was cherry Pepsi? There was cherry a cherry Pepsi can in there. There was also, um, there were some water bottles. I'm not sure if they got DNA off those or not. Right. So her, her blood in the back of the RAV in the cargo area and her DNA they found on the bullet. They say they found on the bullet. Those are the only occurrences of her DNA, of which I'm aware. I can't think of any other ones. And it got me thinking, because I've always said that my, my theory is that law enforcement found Teresa already dead. I, I've never believed they killed her. They found her already dead. They possibly burned her body elsewhere and then planted the bones on Stephen's property to frame him. But this post got me thinking that I don't know that I believe that's actually what happened. B 
because I think that if they had found her body, if they had found her dead, but not burned, that would have given them access to her DNA, which they could have then planted all over Stephen's place, inside the garage, inside the trailer. Like, that would have completely cemented what they were trying to say happened. So if they found her body and they burned her body, why didn't they do that? That makes sense. I don't see why they wouldn't have. If I, they, ha- they, they planted wouldn't. other things, why wouldn't they plant that? So I don't think they found her body. I think they found her bones. I think she was already, whoever killed her, she was already burned. And that further supports the idea that I think most of law enforcement really believed that they had the right guy and the things they were doing, they felt they were doing to make sure they got a conviction. There might have been a couple of them that that knew that it wasn't him, but I don't think they were as in I don't think they were involved in her demise I don't I don't think they had anything to do with that I don't think they they made it happen personally I definitely think they found all of these things and I I believe they used it to make sure they convicted him but I think a lot of them thought they were doing that to convict somebody they thought was guilty right I mean some people say there's no way this was that he was framed because so many people would have to be in on it, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But it, it makes sense to me that there were just a few, very few elite members of a small group of people uh, that were really in on it. And everyone else thought they were framing a guilty man. Right, exactly. And if, if law enforcement didn't plant the bones, if it was the murderer who planted the bones, that would convince law enforcement even more that Stephen was the guilty one and that all of those other things they did were justified because they knew he was guilty. So I don't know. And the thing is, is that just echoes everything, not everything, but a lot of the theories that Kathleen has been putting out there Like she was saying, it wasn't law enforcement. It was the killer. And everybody was like, she's just saying that because she has to and because she's trying not to point the finger at law enforcement. But thinking about it this way makes me agree with that, that if it was the killer and not law enforcement, law enforcement would feel more justified in doing the shady things they did because they they thought he was guilty. They didn't, they didn't know they were doing these things to frame somebody who was innocent. They thought they were doing these things to get a conviction for somebody who was guilty. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily every single member of law enforcement knew that he was innocent, but I think a lot of them thought he was guilty. Um, I'm wondering if as we were saying earlier, they searched his, his trailer for seven searches before they found the key on the eighth search. And I'm wondering if they didn't plant the key. Uh, there's a theory that the, the key wasn't planted because Colburn didn't have a chance to because he was being watched pretty closely by Queso. But I wonder now if they didn't plant the key yet because they didn't know if Steven had an alibi that was solid, you know, they had to wait until they were sure he didn't have an alibi. They were sure that all of the evidence could be used to frame him. Mm -hmm. They, they wanted to make sure that they could do it before they committed to doing it. Does that make sense? I'm just, just now coming up with this in my head, you know, formulating my thoughts about this in my head. But I wonder if that's why it took them so long is they needed that, to be certain that they could frame him. He wasn't going to say, oh, but I was with my attorney throughout that whole day, you know? Mm-hmm. But once they found out that that wasn't the case and the only alibi he actually had was Brendan, mm-hmm. I mean, he spoke on the phone with Jody 
several times that day. And I personally think it's very clear that there was no murdering going on during that right. period of time. Um, but they chose to ignore those calls. But of course, the point is, they had to figure out that he could be framed before they committed to actually framing him. And maybe that's why it took them so long. I think so, too. And I've said that, too, about the statements they coerced Brendan into making during his interrogation, five-hour interrogation. The, the points they tried to get him to say and the things they used to corroborate the quote-unquote evidence they later quote-unquote found as a result of those statements those statements were carefully created because they knew there was evidence they could create from those statements like they had to look at okay we have access to the garage we could hide a bullet underneath here and so we just need to get Brendan to say that she was shot in the garage and then we can use that um we just need Brendan to say this and we can use these swabs to say we swabbed the hood latch like I think their interrogation of Brendan was that planned out but again that only takes one or two people that's that's all it takes and everybody else thinks it's on the up and up and they, they all trust each other. Right. And so they're going to believe what one of the other officers says to them. Oh, well, if, if the captain says that, then it must be true. And so they're just going to roll with it. Nobody's going to question it because that's, you know, they've worked together forever and that's just the way it's always been. But I completely agree with you. The key wasn't there because it, it wasn't time for it to be there yet. You know, it, none of that stuff happened until they needed it to happen. Mm -hmm. It was, it was all too convenient in their favor and too many things that just don't make sense. And so I don't think, I think that if they had played a part in either her death or the burning of her body, we, there would have been her DNA found all over the damn place. Yeah, there would have been. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And there wasn't. So I don't, I don't think, I don't think they participated in that. Um, and I, I think it was the killer. Whoever that is. Whoever that is that, I mean, that seems like the most likely scenario to me. I, I could be wrong, but that seems most likely to me. And what's that um, theory that the simplest explanation is probably the right one? So that's what I think. But I don't know that that says a lot, though, because it would have to be somebody who had access to the property and who could be around without anybody noticing that there's somebody weird around. And I don't know what that really implies. And I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm just saying I, I don't know what that really means. I just I really think that if if law enforcement had done it, that her DNA would be everywhere. I, I don't think they're that stupid. I think they would have put, at least on the key, at least right. on the key. Right. I mean, the fact that there is nothing on that key other than his DNA. And a lot of it. And a lot of it. It's like, it, it was he no sense. running around with it in his mouth or something? I mean, right. even that I don't think would put that much DNA on there. No, and it, it there was nothing else on it. It was completely clean except for his DNA. And that, that doesn't make sense to me either. So I just, I think if they had had more access, access to more of her DNA, it would have been everywhere else because that would have cemented their case more. Mm -hmm. You just said something a minute ago about how someone had, had, the planter would have had to have access to the property and not draw attention to themselves as being an odd person that didn't fit, you know. Mm -hmm. But how much access would they really have had to have? I mean, could they have, I mean, how much, how much access to the property did they really need to plant? All they would have had to do was plant the bones, right? And the RAV. I would not be surprised if it turned out to be law enforcement had planted that RAV there. But it could have been the killer that planted the RAV there. 
it's on the outskirts of the property. They didn't have to drive into the yard to put it there necessarily. They just drove down that, you know, mm -hmm. from behind. It would have been easy for someone to plant that there without anybody seeing them. And it would have been pretty easy for them to come and dump bones out of a burn barrel or a bucket or whatever into Stephen Avery's backyard without anybody seeing them, if it was nighttime especially. So right. other than that, what else is there? Well, there were, there were some of her bones and her phone and her Palm Pilot, right, were embedded in the gunk at the bottom of one of the burn barrels. And so whoever burned her body needed that burn barrel, needed access to burn her body in that burn barrel. So they had to get the burn barrel put her body in it without anybody seeing them on the property if they didn't belong there, burn her wherever, and then dump the bones into the burn pit and then put the burn barrel, wasn't it one of the deer camp barrels, right? Put that back. Or was it one of the yonder barrels? Know. You know, there's a, a whole um, section basically, I've read it about these burn barrels and there were <sighs> yes. some shenanigans with the burn barrels and I want to have someone on to talk about those. Yes. There were either four or five different burn barrels and then one of them was searched two different times and it had left the property and come back. There's a lot of shenanigans mm -hmm. going on with these burn barrels. Um, but if someone just had to come in and get a burn barrel and take off with it and then bring it back later, they could probably do that without being noticed. It's a huge property. I don't know that anybody would see them, especially if they were off behind the houses there. Who's going to well, be looking certainly. out back, you know? Nobody. It's certainly possible, but the chance, I mean, to, to have to go there and get the barrel and take it, I mean, that's, that's risky. It is, but you know, if you're if you've just murdered someone, you're willing to take risks, I guess. Yeah. But I think those burn barrels were kept generally pretty far away from the house, weren't they? Were they? I'm pretty sure. Know. And and once again, I I don't I'm speaking without knowing the facts, so forgive me if I'm wrong, people. Uh, feel free to put something in the comments about your thoughts about the burn barrel. I would love to, to see your thoughts about the burn barrels. But it's my understanding that the Dassey burn barrels were kept as a group, I think there were like four of them, pretty far away from the house. It's not like they had to go up to the garage in front of the garage and grab them or anything. They were back like, so I, I don't know if they could even see back there. I mean, we could look at photos to see, but yeah, we probably um, should do more again, research before we talk about this stuff. <laughs> It's, well, it's, or have a again, guest on that has done the research. Have a guest on that talks about it. You're right. <laughs> um, but I, it's not that it's it's impossible that somebody would have done that. I just when you when you start making it more complicated and more risky, the less the less likely it is in my head for for sense. something like that. And so when it starts to get too complicated like that, is when I start to be like, eh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, Somebody having to go on their property and get a burn barrel and take her and burn her and then bring it back and dump the thing, like being able to do all of those steps without being noticed, of course, it's not impossible. I just don't know that it's, it's very possible that whoever murdered her burned her in, in the burn barrel and left it sitting over on Cuss Road or, or somewhere else and law enforcement found that and dumped it. That's very possible too, where they thought, well, it's right here by his property and he, she was out there to visit his property. So he must have done it. And, you know, let's get rid of this other problem and just conveniently have it found on his property. And then somebody did it and then they all found it there. And now everybody thinks he's guilty. So the burn pit, do we know if bones were actually found in the burn pit? There are no we, photos of the bones in the actual burn nope. pit, correct? There are not. At the end of the flyover video, there is video of bones on the ground somewhere. Hmm. But that's it. It's not collection of bones. It's n nothing like that. It's They're just taking, there's a little bit of wind. You can see some dried leaves. and right. That, that mysteriously and weren't burned. Right. Somehow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. So the only, the only photos I've seen of the actual burn pit are went from when they were 
taking an excavator through this big giant, almost a, tr you know, like a cat or a tractor, which is just, I can't even fathom why they were doing that. It doesn't right. make any sense. Mm -mm. That's not how you treat a crime scene where someone's bones were found. Exactly. You don't. Who does that? Right. Well, Manitowoc, I guess. Well, yeah, apparently. <laughs> and it still really upsets me, too, that Ertl said they didn't take photos because the scene was altered when they got there. And I understand that point of we only take photos. We only document it if it's not disturbed, but they should have taken photos of the fact that it was disturbed. Exactly. Like they should have documented that. Like, I don't, <laughs> that doesn't. <sighs> you you photograph People. the scene however you find it when you get there, Ertl. Yes. And if you have to say, okay, this is how we found it, but it was clearly disturbed. Right. Say that. So they also said the, you know, the, um, the very famous, blood splotch on the dashboard of the RAV that looks exactly like a Q-tip had uh -huh. left it there. So let me preface this by saying I read somewhere that they excused the fact that that looked like a Q-tip mark because that photo was taken after they had taken their sample and that they didn't get a photo of it before they took their sample. So which is it guys? Do you take photos before the scene is altered or after the scene is altered. You can't say on one hand, we don't take pictures if the scene has been altered. And then on the other hand, say, we didn't take a picture before it was altered, but here we took this picture after. Because to me, it's very clear that that splotch of blood was left by a Q-tip. And it doesn't, even if they said, you know, that was taken after we put our swab through it it still doesn't look like that to me it doesn't look like that to me either and we have I swear we have documented of them saying that it looks like it was left there by his finger being bent yes I did see that um I don't know who said that but I did see I that, that and I saw a photograph of you know someone's finger next yeah. to the thing which also doesn't it doesn't make, hold water for me that it doesn't the whole theory it, and that's the thing everybody's like but it's so far away from the keyhole there's no way he could have touched it and playing devil's advocate for a second sometimes if i'm about to drive a car i've never driven even sometimes in my own car I go to put the key in and if I'm not looking, I, I miss the keyhole, right? And so you're kind of fumbling around trying to find where the key goes. And it's very possible that he could have touched right there with his finger as he was fiddling around for it. But number one, it wouldn't have left a mark like that. Number two, if he was actively bleeding, there would have been blood everywhere along with fingerprints. So it's not just that one little thing that proves anything because what about all of these other points? You can't, you, it's not a sound argument. Agreed. So let's see, this is episode 10. We have a lot of people on our list that are scheduled out for the next several months. Um, so it's gonna take us a while to get to everyone, but I'm really, really excited about some of the guests, all of the guests that we have coming up. Um, yeah, we're going to get into some really interesting topics, and I can't wait. It's going to be great. Season two is going to be awesome. Yeah, it is. I'm really excited, too. But I'm also looking forward to taking a little break here. It's not going to be a long break. I, I can't say exactly how long it's going to be. <laughs> Probably just a few weeks. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think, Julie? How long of a break should we take? <laughs> not, not too long. Not too long. Yeah. Nope. Getting everybody lined up is challenging because people are all over the world and in different time zones. And but that's that's the exciting part too. There are supporters all over the world, and it's really awesome to be able to hear the perspective of someone, especially from people outside the United States, uh, their their reflections on our justice system and, in particular, how things played out in this case. And this case doesn't reflect very well on our justice system, does it? <laughs> it does not. Mm -hmm. It definitely does not. So that'll wrap up this episode and this season of 80 More Things. 
If you have a topic you want us to cover or you would like to be a guest on a future episode of this podcast, visit our website at 80morethings.com and let us know what you want to talk about. While you're there, check out some of the links I've posted for the Center on Wrongful Convictions of Youth, the Innocence Project, workwithkz.com, and bringbrendonhome.org. I'm also still working on posting all of the 80 Days of 80 More Things on the website. Don't forget to check out Stacy Seabrook on YouTube. He's got an entire collection called Songs in the Key of Freedom. I'll link that in the show notes. Come get involved and let's see if we can get some actual justice for Teresa because the person responsible for her death is still out there. Thank you for joining us on season one and we'll see you on season two. And keep talking about it. Yes. Until next time, take care. Let's keep talking about Avery. Yeah, let's keep talking till he set free. Oh, you just listen, I think you'll see. Why it matters, it really matters. I could go on listing things off, any more things. I just keep on singing these songs till Avery's freedom rings.